On Sunday morning, President Obama closed the dedication ceremony of the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial with a speech that highlighted the civil rights leaders' struggles and the obstacles the nation currently faces. If he were alive today, I believe he would remind us that the unemployed worker can rightly challenge the excesses of Wall Street without demonizing all who work there. Those with power and privilege will often decry any call for change as divisive. They'll say any challenge to the existing arrangements are unwise and destabilizing. Dr. King understood that peace without justice was no peace at all. Thousands of people gathered on the National Mall to honor the legacy of the assassinated leader and to dedicate the Granite Monument, which is situated on the line of leadership between the Lincoln and Jefferson memorials. Dr. King's daughter, Bernice King, spoke about her father's legacy and what he would think about the recent Occupy Wall Street protests happening around the country. We should never adjust to the one percent controlling more than 40 percent of the wealth. I hear my father saying we must have a radical revolution of values and a reordering of our priorities in this nation. Over the same weekend, Dr. King's family and civil rights leaders gathered to dedicate the monument. The Occupy Wall Street protests grew even larger. Over 6,000 people marched to Times Square, where several were arrested for taking down police barriers. In Chicago, 175 people were arrested earlier Sunday after refusing to take down their tents in Grant Park. Protesters in London clarified their demands while police and protesters clashed in Rome. Today marks the one month anniversary of the Occupy Wall Street protest and their calls for social and economic justice for the 99 percent. Joining me now is author and civil rights activist Dick Gregory, who attended the Martin Luther King Memorial dedication on Sunday. Thank you very much for joining me tonight, Dick. It's a great honor to have you here. Thank you, my brother. Peace and love to you, and, 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 and what a festivity. <laughs> uh, Dick, you, you marched with Martin Luther King, and you heard a, a, what for you is a young president on Sunday uh, yes. saying, if he were here today. Uh, what are your thoughts about what Dr. King would have to tell us if he were here today? Well, he would say the same thing the president said, but it, it don't work. You see, remember... White folks is born in America with 300 years of white privilege. So you don't deal with that the same way you deal with people that come out the slave pit and manable and behaved. You got a different DNA out there today. And I think this is where America is making a mistake. They don't realize that they dealing with their children escalated in the civil rights movement. You know, do you know white folks are not going to let put hoses on their children and beat them down on the ground. That's how we won. You know, I live in a country that prays us for being nonviolent, but if we decide that we're not going to the war during the draft, we go to jail. It's okay when you're dealing with me. But, and so I would just say we won the greatest movement in the history of the planet is that 1960 civil rights movement. But remember, we wasn't the ones that L got LBJ out there. It was those white kids. And they didn't know you can't go up on Kent and shoot white children like you can shoot Mexicans and black folks. It's, a, you know, it, it, it's the whole thing is different. That's how King, a hundred years from now, this planet, if we survive this, and I got my doubts if this country can survive this, because I don't think they know what they're dealing with. They look at the book. And they think they're dealing with ordinary demonstrations. Bet your life. They, they, look, they asked the same questions, just different, that they said about us. They call them stinky. They don't know what they want. They did this and that and the whole thing. Just like Obama. They call him everything, but they can't call him dumb. And one thing they can't call them, but everything else. And so now they're going to start treating those children the way they treated Negroes, and it's not going to work. They know what they want. What? Nothing. We want it all to change. And it will change. It's the mistake we're making with, with, with uh, Herman Cain. 999. You can laugh at it if you want to. 
and you can listen to all your, your, your academic and talking about this and talking about that, that works okay when you're sitting around the table at Harvard or MIT or Morehouse, but it don't work with my grandmother. Oh, well, she got she got to fill out stuff. She don't even know what's on it. He's talking about simplifying. And you know what's interesting? I'm listening to people react to Herman Cain, especially in the black community, that the black folks reacted to Obama. Most of them didn't think he could win. Most of them thought he was a joke. And then they found out, now, they need to explain some stuff to me about last week. We all went to bed last week and woke up Herman Cain was number one. I said, wait a minute, somebody need to explain that. <laughs> I mean, as good as he did that night, he should stay in bed. We're, he should we're, stay asleep. We're all trying to figure out how he got to number one. Uh, Dick, I want to read something to you uh, from your 1964 autobiography, uh, whose title I cannot say on television, uh, but we will uh, put it up on a screen for people to see so they can find it. It's still in print, still in bookstores. I read this in high school. There was no book that influenced me more change more of my thinking than your book when I read it in high school. I want to read you this, this one passage uh, from your autobiography. Uh, it's, you say, in 1952, I was a welfare case, and in 1963, I was on a list of famous men. In America, with all its evils and faults, you can still reach through the forest and see the sun. But we don't know yet whether that sun is rising or setting in our country. How do you feel about that passage today, Dick? Is the sun rising or setting? It's setting. Uh, America is less than one-fifth of the world's population. Ninety-four percent of all the hard drugs on the planet is consumed by us Americans. That's not counting alcohol, nicotine, snuff, and all the other stuff. There's something wrong with a nation that calls itself the most Christian, the most God-fearing nation in the world, and need that type of drugs to hold up. That's, that's kind of sad. And that's what our children are telling us. They're telling us something is wrong and it needs to be fixed. It's like you get a headache. Anytime your head hurt and you didn't get hit in your head, that's the universal God telling you something's malfunctioning. And so we sit up. We got a country here that, 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 that mix up capitalism with democracy. And then all at once win the money. And let me tell you something. Well, the hard story. See, don't compare these economic times with the depression of, 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 of the, the Great Depression. Why? Because during the Great Depression, white folk didn't have nothing. Okay? In 1950, 71% of white folks in America didn't own a car. I dare you to teach me how to ride a bicycle and then try to unteach me how to ride a bicycle. That's important. And the only reason we survived 1936, that Great Depression, because Roosevelt had the wisdom to know that when you start changing the economic, when you start mass production, you have mass layoffs. And the only way you can save it is you have to create mass consumption. That's what the WPA paid me to dig a hole that didn't need to be dug. Then my cousin came out that night and filled it up. And we get our check, we say, we works for our living. But he was clever enough. And you older folks out there, remember the fireside chat? He didn't talk about how bad the economy was. When he come in that living room on the radio, he said, you have two chickens in every pot and a car in every garage. But he didn't say he was going to put it there. There's something that when you talk to me and I trust you and I feel you, then things change. And so when, 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 when we realize that this is a whole new ball game. It's a whole new economic. And the Tea Party, people say, well, they're racist. They might have been, but that's not what brought them into the street. What brought them into the street is they scared fear. And God do not occupy the same space. And the sooner we know that. See, we sit around, we talk to the military people. We talk, What you need to do is bring in some of the top minds on this planet that understands the whole social structure of human beings and sit down. You can't solve no problem with me. You know what, the Democrats and Republicans, I get hit by a car when I leave this studio tonight and everybody's sitting around arguing about 
Am I hurt? No, just help me. That's all. I just want to hear a nice, kind voice. And we're not hearing that. Dick Gregory, I can't thank you enough for joining me tonight. I can have to tell you that your book, starting with your autobiography and then your rewrites of American history, have rewritten my understanding of the history of this country and our common experience. Dick, thank you very much for joining me tonight. Thank you, my brother. Love you. Peace.